Hey everybody and welcome to Rugby Wrap Up. I'm your host Matt McCarthy and I'm at the Pig and Whistle in New York City and have the pleasure of being here with Mike Tolkien who was recently the Team USA Men's Eagles head coach during the Rugby World Cup and prior to that. Mike, thanks for coming by. Good to be here Matt. So before we get into the heavy lifting, how are you? What are you doing now? I'm good, Matt. Um, right now, I'm just doing various things, keeping myself involved in rugby. Uh, I've done some clinics, worked with some coaches, um, and had a time to sit back and relax and breathe a little bit. You know, it's been been a constant run for the last 25 years of, of work in rugby and, and being associated with teams. So right now, it's uh, it's kind of refreshing just to have a little time to step back and uh, and just take it all in. Before we begin, your bio includes playing and teaching at Xavier High School, a playing and coaching career with the New York Athletic Club that at certain points was simultaneous to you coaching at Xavier High School, and you won multiple national championships with both Xavier and the New York Athletic Club. You had various coaching roles with Team USA's men's Eagles in the 15s division, including being the head coach. You are married, have a son, and up until recently were the head coach of Team USA, but were replaced by the current head coach, John Mitchell. All accurate so far? I would put taught, because I'm not right now. All right, is, uh, is there a potential to go back to Xavier? Yes. Okay, to keep this somewhat objective and in the name of fairness, many of these questions will come from fans and the rugby wrap-up staff. Good to go. Most people, including yours truly, learned about your dismissal via a blurb on the USA Rugby website announcing that the Men's Eagles program was accepting applications for the head coaching position but head coach Mike Tolkien whose contract had expired after the World Cup was more than welcome to reapply. Is that how you found out and how did that blurb make you feel? Well, I, I didn't find out on the website. Uh, I spoke to Nigel Melville first and he informed me that this was going to be the process. To be frank, I didn't, uh, I didn't think that process was the right way to go. I, I thought they knew my body of work. They knew I had an interest in returning. Certainly, I would have put forth my vision, which I did you know, voluntarily, and I expected that. Um, I certainly would have spoken to people uh, in articulating that. But at that point, you know, I certainly believe that either ask me to return or let me go. Uh, I, I don't think that step was necessary. Uh, I certainly don't feel entitled to the job. You know, the, uh, it's a privilege to be the head coach, to be a player, uh, and I didn't feel that that job was mine to keep. Um, but I thought that the process wasn't done right, and that's and that, and, and that, that's not something that's hidden. Um, that's something that is public. Uh, that's something I expressed to Melville and the chairman of the board. So I, I didn't think that process was done very well at all. What was the expectation? at the World Cup. Was there, was there an expectation to win a match? And if so, which match? The number of games to win was never articulated. There was allusions to winning two matches, uh, but we could have just as easily lost four games. Uh, there was certainly a possibility to win two games, uh, but it was never clearly articulated what those expectations were. Uh, and it's always been my belief and clearly stated publicly that our infrastructure here in American rugby, certainly over the last seven years, has not supported winning these types of games. We did not have a high performance program. We did not have a professional league. We did not have full-time players. And our age grade program was going in the wrong direction as was our domestic competition. Japan has their own professional league, chock with former international players. Samoa players are playing all over Europe and in Super Rugby. Scotland, South Africa obviously have major competitions. Um, and 12 of our players, 13 of our players, were, were domestic part-time players. Amadreza Bahrami in Fresno, California asks, what was the difference in the Rugby World Cup game versus Scotland? The boys played with Scotland but eventually lost the momentum. It's a good question. I think uh, a really main trigger point was when they scored so quickly in the second half. We had a lot of momentum, a lot of confidence, uh, and I think it was about two and a half minutes in they had a score, there was a little defensive mistake there. Uh, we let that in, and shortly after that, we again found ourselves through a penalty deep in our own defending, and that became a little bit of a bad cycle where we were defending deep in uh, off a couple of penalties, and it just started wearing us out. Scotland was able to capitalize on it. Uh, on another note, the first half we had early on, we had throwing trouble, or line out trouble. And while we did have the lead at halftime, I think we could have really built on that lead. 
uh, in the first half if we had done better with the lineup, which eventually sorted itself out. But the, the second half, the early score and playing deep in our end, defending a lot, uh, I think wore us out and was the difference. Matt Finnerty in Rockville Center, New York. Did it bother you that Todd Clever took his cause to social media and fans trashed you as a result? It did bother me. I thought that the, I thought posting the entire interview uh, without checking facts, the people who posted it, uh, that was an issue. Uh, there was unsubstantiated things in there that bothered me. And I think putting the dirty laundry in social media is just a bad habit that's become too common. And uh, I didn't like it. And I didn't like the fact that there were things that weren't true in that. So, but there's nothing I can do. Um, it's not my MO and I thought it was done, I thought it was done in poor taste. Robert Kemp in Idaho, what was your favorite victory and which loss hurt the most? I think my favorite victory was when we beat Georgia in Georgia. Uh, they're, they're a difficult team to play to begin with, but it's a very difficult place to play. It's hostile and we played a very good game. It was physical, it was hard. Georgia came roaring back and took a late lead and we won on the last second that's right. kick. That's right. And my other favorite was when we beat Romania in my first year in 2012, November of 2012, and we beat them very convincingly. Uh, it was expected to be a difficult game uh, with a, our scrum having all sorts of trouble, and I think we won by 29 points, and we played some fantastic rugby in that game. So I think a couple of the disappointing losses, um, ironically, we played Ireland, and it was a mixed side, mixed Ireland side, and we lost 15 to 12. In and Houston. Was, in Houston. Um, it was a lot of kicking by both sides and you know we were so close to beating Ireland I think in that sense it was a little bit disappointing not to actually get it being so close. Uh, I don't think we outplayed them in the gap match but it was there for the taking so having that one would have been a nice pelt. Uh, and another disappointing loss was when we lost to Fiji in November uh, of 2014. Uh, we had a really depleted side. We lost all the European pros. We lost all the sevens players. And we really had a team that was cobbled together, yet we played them close and, and we lost by six points and we were putting a hell of a lot of pressure on late in the game. And two opportunities to really score and we squandered. But, but the guys played fantastic that night and it would have been great to have that. Again, would have been the first one against Fiji on the road with a depleted squad would have been really satisfactory. So that was, I was disappointed not to get it. Mark Riley in New York City. While this is a good get, meaning the interview here, Mike Tolkien is and remains a class act on my card uh, for stepping up to take the questions at this time and good for Rugby Wrap Up to, pro to provide the platform. That's not a question. That's actually a plug for both of us, so we'll take it and allow it. Ryan Day. How much did Paul Emmerich's injury forced retirement set back the development of the back line as far as losing one player that could break the gain line and provide quicker ball opportunities to your halfbacks? Losing Paul when we did right before the qualifiers against Canada in 2013 uh, was disappointing. It was a big loss. Uh, Paul is a dynamic player. He was, uh, he was always able to break gain line. So losing him was tough and uh, it, took a, it took a bit of punch out of our back line for sure. I tried to talk Paul into it, um, but I knew in speaking to him that his mind was set, it was time, and, uh, and he retired, unfortunately. Mike Holtzman in Denver. What lessons did you learn over the previous four years that you'd be able to apply now if you were still Eagles head coach? I think uh, you know, certainly came to fruition the World Cup. I think trying to, uh, I think less is more. Sometimes you find yourself providing too much information, feeding the players too much. Um, whether it be halftime, pre-game, leading up to the game. I think we'd give the, the players a little bit more breathing time, a little bit more focus time, just catch their wind, a couple of tactical points. I mean, you always want to do that. I think looking back would make a better effort to do that more productively. Uh, I think feedback from the players is something that we took, but I'd, you know, I'd give more occasion to do that. And I think the third thing is we met with playmakers a lot, and that became something that we really honed and did pretty well. I think we'd be more inclusive, including everyone in on that process uh, in speaking to the play, all the players more um, about tactical rather than just taking a, a smaller group. So I, I think that you know, while we certainly provided an open forum, uh, I think making more of an effort to include people in that process would be something. Another question from Mike Holtzman. What is the best way to manage the sevens and 15 split in the United States? 
should players be exclusively looked at in one or is this country not in the point yet where you can have that luxury? That's a good question because if you look at tier one nations, they have that luxury. Young players who are promising with sevens ability and prospects, they'll be put right in the sevens program. If they show promise, they might play one or two years there and move on and go on to the 15s and professional international circuit. Um, for us, we're not quite there yet. I think we're getting there. And I think the demands of seven, if you include Olympics, uh, are gonna force players to spend the majority of their time there. And now if you look at the inclusion of the ARC, it's gonna be hard for players to cross over. Uh, and then when you throw in necessary rest into that equation. So I, I think we're gonna move, and it's gonna be an organic move to sevens players going through that process, that system, and when and if they're ready or desire to come out and play 15s full time, they'll do that. So, our own resident rugby rain man, Junois Blaybert, wants to know what your relationship is with Nigel Melville, who has announced that he'll be going back to England to run the RFU. Well, I've expressed to Nigel, I you know I didn't agree with the process how it was run. It's certainly his and the board's prerogative to change coaches uh, as they see fit and I don't have an issue with that. That's the nature of the business. Uh, and I've also stated some of the things that I thought should have been institutionalized in American rugby. But these are policies, you know, and people have disagreements with how things should be done, what should be done. Uh, but there's nothing personal. There's certainly nothing personal. I'm sure, you know, I know he would say the same. So, um, you know, we've had really not much of a relationship since January in terms of communicating, but there's nothing that I hold personal um, and hasn't been for any particular reason other than the way the dynamics have worked out. Jeff Andrews, a Kiwi living in New York and uh, rugby lifer, uh, says, you must have been disappointed by the many basic mistakes, kicking, hitting, chip kicks, passing that the Eagles displayed at the Rugby World Cup. He says, I know you didn't coach them to perform like that. What happened? Well, it's always disappointing when, when the team doesn't perform basic, uh, basic skills and you as a coach and a coaching staff take responsibility for it and you feel that it's your job to make them better. Uh, and so we do. And players will have been disappointed in doing it because they are better players than that. And uh, again, it, it's not a simple narrative. You know, people want to make it a simple narrative in, in these types of things, but it's not. You know, it's more complex than that. Uh, if we look at the 13 or so part-time players that we have who are working jobs playing domestic rugby, first-time World Cuppers playing in front of crowds that they've never played in front of, those all add to the narrative. So, yes, Jeff, we were definitely disappointed. It was something we worked on a lot. And um, I think that the players will come out better players having gone through the experience. Final question, not rugby related. Who is going to be the next president of the United States? Not who you want, who is going to be the next president of the United States? Donald J. Trump. You done? Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Coach. Uh, we appreciate everything, and uh, we wish you nothing but the best. Thank you, Matt. Always a pleasure to be on the show. I appreciate it. It's always fun. Matt McCarthy for Rugby Wrap-Up here at the Pig & Whistle in New York City. And then to stand here, how are you feeling? I'm Phil Teal, and you're watching Rugby Wrap-Up. Is that it? Do it again and give me the at the end. Really? Yeah. What, is it going on Grinder?